This video is going to uh, give an overview of the evolution of the respiratory system in vertebrates. And to start, um, even before there were vertebrates, even before there were chordates, there were deuterostomes. And going back to the most primitive deuterostomes in the fossil record, or the uh, more primitive deuterostomes alive uh, today, the hemichordate worms, like this acorn worm, one sees uh, a significant feature of slits in the throat, uh, pharyngeal arches. And so these deuterostomes can make use of these for feeding. So if you suck water in your mouth and you have slits in your throat, you can kind of create this current where water comes in your mouth at your throat. And the um, oral uh, cavity in the pharynx were lined by ciliated cells. And so any uh, debris in uh, the water could then get trapped in mucus and then cilia could sweep this towards the, uh, the stomach. And this is a way that they could filter feed and eat. So creating a constant flow of water allowed them to trap you know, small microorganisms, algae, organic particles uh, from the water and mucus sweep it towards uh, the uh, stomach. Now, uh, this is not only significant in the evolution of gills, which I will uh, get to, but I still do that as do you. And so when we inhale air, there's debris there, dust, you know, dirt, um, uh, smoke, ash particles, et cetera, that we don't want to get in our delicate lungs. And so we secrete mucus in the nasal cavity, the pharynx. Uh, we trap these particles and ciliated cells sweep them to our stomach. Um, so we still do this, even though we're not using it as, you know, our primary way of feeding, uh, it's rather to protect the lungs. Nevertheless, this ancient mechanism uh, persists even in us. But um, the first chordates would be defined by a number of uh, features. Uh, so while this hemichordate can suck using this uh, current where water comes in, water comes out the throat, and they can use this uh, to eat. Um, uh, the uh, chordates, as we'll see, are going to add something new. They will add blood vessels to these uh, arches. And so uh, these arches um, get more developed. They will actually develop cartilage. So chordates uh, have uh, cartilage in uh, these arches to help keep them open. That will be the precursor of the uh, gill arches in uh, fish. And then in humans, the trachea, the larynx, um, uh, even uh, in uh, the early fish at the jaws, as uh, we saw with the skull. Um, so the features of the chordates are the notochord, the dorsal nerve cord, the postanal tail, but now also the blood vessels which get added here mean that as water is leaving, so this is uh, from a shark, as you suck water in, water leaves through the throat. If there's rich blood vessels uh, here, gas exchange can occur, and now oxygen from the water can go into the blood. So now these slits function as gills. And so while the first deuterosomes were using these primarily uh, to uh, eat, uh, then the uh, chordates and the um, uh, and the uh, first uh, fish would enrich the blood supply here and use them as gills. Now, I don't do that, um, but when uh, we land vertebrates were embryos, we still developed these pharyngeal uh, arches uh, so here is a pig embryo. We still had bars of cartilage going to these arches. We still had a branch of the aorta going to each of these arches. So as embryos, we retain these pharyngeal arches. It's one of the defining features of the chordates. And here, once again, in uh, my trachea and nasal cavity and pharynx, I have ciliated cells. And so debris gets um, uh, trapped in mucus and then cilia will uh, sweep it away from uh, the uh, lungs. So this was uh, significant because once gills evolved, uh, then this meant that the chordates could provide more oxygen um, uh, from uh, the water to their bodies, this allowed them to be more active swimmers. And so here I have a uh, you know, a you know, cartoon representing a sports contest where a chordate and a hemichordate are swimming away. From, uh, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Here's the first one where uh, the chordate um, 
because of the suction, uh, it's able to uh, trap uh, more food. And here in the second edition, there is a race uh, between the chordate and the uh, hemichordate. Uh, the hemichordate uh, gets less oxygen because it doesn't have gills. So as the two of them are swimming, the yellow chordate, which is now using these as gills, is providing more oxygen to its skeletal muscles and is able to swim faster. So as this uh, early predator, Anomalocaris uh, chases the two of them, it's able to catch the hemichordate and not uh, the chordate. So having uh, these uh, gills was an uh, advantage. Now, um, uh, as we look at the circulatory system uh, later, uh, we can see uh, how um, blood is oxygenated here. So here, if you remove the opercular bones, so when you look at the face of a fish, uh, it has a number of big bones covering the gills. They are called the op opercular uh, bones. It's a series of bones. The amphibians would lose these. Um, if you were to remove uh, a, a the opercular bones, you would see a cartilage branchial bar and then uh, the filaments of the gills. So once again, the uh, gill arches are made of cartilage. And, you know, as we develop an embryos, we can modify that uh, to, you know, the trachea and the larynx. Um, but uh, this uh, represents the most primitive part of the skull, the uh, uh, the series of cartilaginous gill arches, what's known as the splanchnocranium. And the splanchnocranium makes contributions even to our uh, skeletons, like the hyoid bone uh, and part of the, uh, the sphenoid uh, uh, bone. Um, uh, it would also then form uh, the, the first jaws in the cartilaginous fish, as we will uh, see. Um, and so uh, here's, once again, uh, those opercular bones uh, you can see. Uh, so the heart in fish pumps blue deoxygenated blood away from the heart through what's called a ventral aorta. Now this seems a little odd because I don't have one now. I have a dorsal aorta where the blood's going that way. I don't have a ventral aorta where the blood's going this way, but I once did as an embryo and fish still do. This ventral aorta then goes to the throat region and sends out these branches to the gill arches. Here they form capillary beds. And as water leaves through the gill arches, the oxygen in the water goes into the capillaries. And this blue deoxygenated blood then becomes red oxygenated blood. This red oxygenated blood then goes to that dorsal aorta, which distributes um, oxygenated blood now throughout the body. So in a shark's gills, there are capillaries coming off these uh, small uh, arteries, uh, which get oxygen. These then feed into the dorsal aorta, which goes down the back of the shark um, and uh, distributes uh, oxygenated blood. But from the shark's heart, there is a ventral aorta. Now, one of the um, things which makes gills so functional is what is called countercurrent flow. Countercurrent flow uh, means that you have two flu fluids moving in opposite directions. And so in the gills, water is moving one way, blood actually moves the opposite way, the way the blood vessels are uh, oriented. And so if the um, uh, the blood is going this way uh, from right to left. The water is going the opposite direction from left to right. Why is that an advantage? Well, um, in as the blood goes this way, the blood with the least oxygen is over here, all right? The blood with the most oxygen is over here. Uh, as water goes through the gills and as oxygen is extracted, the uh, uh, water with the most oxygen is over here. The water with the least oxygen is over here. And so even though this is the blood with the most oxygen, um, here is the water with the most oxygen, so oxygen will come into the blood. Even though uh, uh, the water loses oxygen as it goes into the gills, and this water has less oxygen than this water over here. By the time we get here, we still 
have more oxygen in the water than in the gills here. So still water is going from the, I'm sorry, oxygen is going from the water into the gills. So because of what's called this countercurrent mechanism, because um, blood is going one way and um, uh, water is going the other, this will maximize the oxygen fusion from water uh, to um, uh, blood. If they were going in the same direction, you would get to a point where the two would equilibrate and then no more diffusion of oxygen would occur in the terminal uh, portions uh, here. So it is uh, this countercurrent flow which helps to maximize the amount of uh, oxygen which uh, diffuses uh, into uh, uh, the, uh, the blood. And now fish get a lot of oxygen for their skeletal muscles and they are active swimmers. So this uh, was a precursor uh, when the early chordates evolved. Invertebrates ruled, all right, the dominant organisms in the ocean were armored squid, were sea scorpions, were trilobites, were anomalocarids, um, et cetera. Um, but fish then became dominant. And one of the things that fish can do is be active swimmers, uh, efficiently getting oxygen to their, um, uh, to their skeletal uh, muscles. And so here you can see uh, in uh, this shark, water is coming in uh, the mouth and out uh, these uh, gills, but there are uh, blood vessels in the gills which are removing oxygen from the uh, water. And this then circulates through the dorsal aorta and supplies the tissues of uh, the body uh, with uh, oxygen. And so uh, the first fish appear in the Cambrian period 500 million years ago. And there were no vertebrates other than fish until 350 million years ago. Uh, and so for about 200 million years, this was the way, or as we'll see, the primary way that fish were breathing and getting their oxygen supply. And so when we start the respiratory system, given that um, these gills help give rise to the vertebrates and that for 200 million years, uh, this was the only or the major way that vertebrates uh, were breathing, uh, gills are certainly uh, significant. Now, uh, I will start talking about uh, respiration in organisms on land, although it should uh, be noted that um, uh, amphibians can still have gills. We uh, mammals form pharyngeal arches as embryos, but we never have gills. Um, but these uh, tadpoles do. Now, I know, you know, we associate, we don't associate tadpoles looking like you know, this, uh, the, the tadpoles we're used to seeing have internal gills, but after they hatch for a couple of days, they actually do have external gills as uh, well. And the oxygen supply in the water uh, when they hatch can determine how long those uh, external gills remain. So tadpoles can have in, uh, internal gills and for a few days, external gills. Um, the uh, uh, larvae of salamanders can once again have uh, external gills, these feathery extensions where deoxygenated blood is sent here, gas exchange occurs, and now oxygen can go uh, throughout uh, the body. Uh, these salamander larvae want there to be some flow of water because if the water was too stagnant, uh, then they would absorb the oxygen from the uh, water. And, and then, you know, the gills would not be uh, meeting the body's needs uh, any uh, longer. And so um, gills persisted in the, uh, in, uh, the early uh, amphibians. Okay. Um, uh, now, as I'm uh, depicting, uh, the respiratory system evolved over uh, millions of years. And so we saw that, you know, from the hemichordates getting part of it even before it became true uh, uh, gills. Um, but if we were to then uh, look at, you know, the parts of the human um, respiratory system, uh, we would see that, you know, the early deuterostomes had some features which would be important for the uh, human uh, respiratory system. If we were to then to advance to the early chordates, once again, there would be a few more uh, parts. Uh, the earliest uh, uh, fish, um, uh, et cetera. And so uh, this is 
it, it's not as if it's an either or where there's fish or there's you know uh, mammals uh, as uh, I'm uh, developing uh, the human respiratory system uh, uh, evolved in these uh, stages. Um, and so I know that seems counterintuitive because you could say, well, like, you know, how could something, you know, not have a respiratory system? Well, we can see that, you know, like, you know, the hemichordates, they used gill slits for eating before they were used for respiration. And so, you know, these early complex, complex structures could uh, develop in transitions, um, uh, uh, etc. Um, so uh, here's just a picture of the mucus. Um, the next video I'd like to show is that of cutaneous uh, respiration, because even before there were gills, um, gas exchange can occur in the skin. Um, but this is why a lot of invertebrates are small, um, and this is why a lot of them are flat, because they are getting their oxygen met only through uh, the skin. There's no specialized uh, respiratory organs. It's what's called cutaneous uh, respiration. Uh, so, you know, this goes back to the first invertebrates. Here you see flatworms. One of the reasons that they are flat um, is that uh, they are uh, using their skin uh, as uh, the source of, uh, of gas exchange. Um, so fish can still do that to some degree, um, especially uh, there are fish alive today which lack scales. So there are eels which lack scales. Uh, there are catfish uh, which uh, lack uh, scales and they can actually get um, significant amount of gas exchange occurring through their skin as well as do some uh, amphibians. And so um, when vertebrates come on to uh, land, oh, that's here somewhere. Uh, you will see that um, they still need to keep their skin moist because they are still performing significant amounts of um, cutaneous respiration. So if you were to say dissect a frog and the blood vessels have been injected with red and blue dye, you would see a rich vasculature uh, just uh, deep uh, to uh, the skin. Um, this is uh, very unlike what uh, humans uh, have. Why so many blood vessels uh, to the skin? Well, because the uh, amphibians are breathing through their skin. So even before there was gills, there was cutaneous respiration. You could perform gas exchange through the, the skin. Um, some fish still rely on that to a great uh, deal, like some catfish and uh, eels. Um, they can even you know, uh, be exposed to uh, oxygen in the air and perform gas exchange that way. So some eels, uh, some uh, catfish, uh, when they come out onto land briefly, like if they're up by the shore, they can be breathing through their skin. And here you can see in frogs and salamanders, um, they can have a rich vasculature uh, going uh, to their uh, skin uh, to allow for cutaneous uh, respiration. Um, now that's good because as we'll see, even though amphibians have uh, lungs, um, they don't work very well. So here is a salamander. Um, now in general, salamander lungs don't work very well, but the most common family of salamanders in um, North America is the family Plethodontidae, uh, the lungless salamander. So the slimy salamander is one of that family. It doesn't even have lungs. It performs all of its gas exchange through uh, cutaneous uh, respiration. Uh, in addition, there is one uh, species of frog alive uh, today, uh, which is the uh, flat-headed uh, frog in Borneo, uh, which is also lungless. Um, and so uh, once again, uh, in uh, respiration isn't something where uh, you absolutely need uh, one um, uh, one structure. Uh, before there were gills, there was cutaneous respiration. Um, and then before there were lungs, there were gills. Now, uh, as I start to make the transition to talk about uh, lungs, uh, I do want to mention uh, the nostrils. Because if you say we're to look at a shark, you might be surprised to see that it has a pair of nostrils on each side of the face. So there's an anterior nostril, and a posterior nostril. And when a shark is swimming, 
uh, water comes in this anterior nostril, leaves the posterior nostril, and it's smelling, say it's smelling for blood in the water or potential prey, et cetera. So um, the nostrils just open onto a tube, which allows the, uh, the sharks to smell the water. But as sarcopterygian fish, remember these are uh, the fish, especially common in the Devonian, which were the ancestors of amphibians, um, as they adapted to a more terrestrial environment. There was one species known as Canichthys, uh, which moved the posterior nostril to the jaw margin. So it, so it would have gone from here to here. And then subsequently, the uh, you, uh, the Sarcopterygian fish uh, moved the posterior nostril here to the roof of the mouth. Now that changes everything because if you're, you know, um, breathing in water, water can go in this hole and out that hole. If you come out on land, all right, then once again, if you could, you know, somehow create, you know, suction, which would be difficult here, then, you know, air would go through this tube. But if it was here, all right, then any air that came in this external nostril, anterior nostril here, would now come out on the roof of the mouth. And if your mouth is closed, this could now go into, you know, an air sac or uh, lungs. So this is now known as the internal narus or coena. Uh, and so we have one. When we bring air into our nasal cavity, the nasal cavity doesn't end blindly. It's not the sac and the air has to then come out the nose. No, it can keep going because there's a hole on the other side of the nasal cavity, the internal uh, narus, which then allows the air to just keep on, um, uh, uh, to keep on uh, going. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, that uh, again uh, in, presently with uh, some pictures in uh, amphibians. Um, once again, getting this back to this idea is, you know, how could a respiratory system evolve? Because you'd say, oh, if you don't have lungs, you could suffocate and die, right? Well, here you can see catfish, which are coming to the surface to feed, but also they can breathe, right? And so I, I know, you know, discussing the evolution of the, re of the respiratory system, it sounds odd. How could like fish with gills become amphibians with lungs? Well, as we saw, amphibians can have gills, all right? And as we're about to see, fish can have lungs. So it isn't like this either or that all of a sudden you're stopping a fish with gills and you start being an amphibian with lungs. Um, there were uh, fish, sarcopterygian fish and amphibians that had both gills and lungs. And so then as adaptation onto land occurred, just the transition occurred where the gills were used less and the lungs were used more and uh, more gradually over millions of years. Um, so fish do sometimes breathe the air. You can see it occasionally, depending on where you are and what fish species are around. So here you see fish coming up to the air to suck the air. Why? Well, because this is still water, it's stagnant. There's not a lot of oxygen. If you fish, then you know that if you wanna catch, say, trout, you're not going to go to a warm, stagnant pool. There's not enough oxygen there. You're better off going to a fast moving river as the water flows over the rocks. It's adding uh, oxygen to uh, the air. So active trout need more oxygen. Um, they can't live in oxygen depleted waters. What are you to do if you're a fish living in waters which uh, are depleted of their oxygen uh, supply as a pond might be, as waters are, as the temperature gets warmer in summer? Well, a number of fish have gills and breathe through their gills, but have other ways of supplementing the oxygen in their gills. So they can suck in water and perform gas exchange uh, with the roof of their mouth. Some um, have vascularized um, fins. Um, as some like eels and catfish, as I've mentioned, have lost their uh, skin. Um, but there are a number of fish, such as this mudskipper. Here is a fish, but it feeds on land. It comes out onto land and it breathes while on land. And there are actually a number of different ways that um, uh, the, uh, uh, the fish uh, can do that but I'm going to focus on one, okay? So even though there's a number of ways that modern fish can perform gas exchange, uh, there's one that's most interesting to us. 
by the time of the early uh, bony fish, right? So the first bony fish uh, evolving in the Silurian uh, period, um, they seemed to have had a bag known as a swim bladder. Now today, the teleos fish, which dominate, and they're the group which appears first in the Triassic period, they use the swim bladder for buoyancy, okay? Um, but the original uh, purpose of this swim bladder seems to have been for breathing, not as much for buoyancy. It's pretty big, all right? So here in this gar that I'm dissecting, this essentially uh, runs the length from uh, the throat to the region of the pelvis. So like in you, you know, the region from your throat to your pelvis, that's a big region on your body. This is a comparable region here. So here's a bag, um, which is sizable. It stretches a considerable length uh, along uh, the length of the uh, fish. So uh, if you were to look at, um, most fish have this, most of the bony fish. Um, uh, but if you were to look at the most primitive bony fish, like a gar, like a sturgeon, like a bowfin. Um, so here is a bowfin swim bladder. Um, this swim bladder is not primarily for buoyancy. Um, it is for breathing oxygen. So this sturgeon isn't moving as uh, uh, much as a typical fish does, nor does this gar. The teleos, teleos fish with that uh, airbag used for buoyancy are much much more agile swimmers, but these fish can come to the surface and take a gulp of air. Now, do they have gills? Yes, they do, and their gills are giving them oxygen. However, they can supplement the oxygen from the gills by taking air into this uh, swim uh, bladder. And so lots of fish then don't have to choose between you know, breathing water, uh, oxygen in the water or oxygen in the air, they can do both. They have different anatomical structures. So the swim bladder empties into the esophagus. When they swallow the, uh, if they swallow air, the air can be directed into the swim bladder. Um, when we look at the lungs of a salamander, the lungs of a salamander empty into the esophagus. All right. So once again, lungs of uh, the salamander all open into the esophagus. Here you see a fish. Its swim bladder opens into the esophagus. Now, because this is the condition of the most primitive bony fish alive today, um, and here you can see you know, the swim bladder even has divisions, kind of like lungs, to uh, enhance uh, gas exchange. Um, uh, this seems to be the condition of the most primitive bony fish that this uh, air swag, uh, this swim bladder was for respiration, not for the buoyancy that most fish use it for today. Here's a bowfin. Once again, the uh, air sac uh, empties into the esophagus and has septa. But remember, oh, I'm sorry, before I do that, and if you were to look at the swim bladder under the microscope, what you see is here's the air. All right, here's the lining of the swim bladder, but here are capillaries. See the red blood cells there? All right, and you know, fish red blood cells are nucleated. Um, so what is a lung? A lung is a sac of air where you get the air very close to capillaries. There are these very thin cells that make up the lining. And because it's so thin, you can get gas exchange occurring here. Well, this swim bladder has exactly the same setup. You've got a sack of air, you've got capillaries of blood and a very thin partition between them, so thin that you'll get gas uh, exchange. And so the swim bladder in the first bony fish functioned uh, primarily as a gas exchange. In fact, some of those primitive bony fish can actually drown if you prevent them come, from coming to the surface of the water because the water isn't giving them enough oxygen. They need to supplement it with oxygen from the air. Now, um, from the first bony fish arose two lineages, the ray fin actinopterygian fish and then the sarcopterygian fish. And the sarcopterygian fish took this one single swim bladder and then they split it into two. All right, so what used to be a swim bladder going from the throat to the pelvic fin area is now two bags. The bag got split into two, and now we call them lungs. So sarcopterygian fish can have true lungs. There are lung fish, they have lungs. Now I'm not being generous. Oh, let's be generous and call them lungs. No, these are lungs and they work better than amphibian um, 
I mean, I'm just, that's not a tall order. You know, a lot of amphibians don't even have lungs and they do all their breathing through their skin. Um, so uh, lungfish uh, have true lungs and look at these big blood vessels. Not only did they take that air sac and split it into two, they created larger uh, blood vessels and a better partitioning in the, uh, in the circulatory system um, to separate oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Um, and so uh, they are getting uh, more efficient gas exchange from here. Now here's a perch. Now it has a swim bladder, but it's not using it to breathe. The gases in here are used for buoyancy. And if we look at the teleos fish alive today, they're great swimmers. You know, they're very agile, they're very mobile, better than sharks, better than sturgeon and gar and those, uh, uh, and lungfish and those, uh, look at all of that maneuverability. I mean, it, it's wonderful. And, and the, uh, the uh, use of the swim bladder for buoyancy is a big uh, part uh, of that. Um, but uh, getting back uh, to uh, uh, respiration, um, so, uh, uh, there was a time where it wasn't an either or, where you had to choose, you know, do I breathe through gills or do I breathe uh, through uh, lungs? Um, instead, you had both. So fish had lungs and fish had gills. And in water like this, which is murky, you know, and perhaps a stagnant, uh, if you were in a swamp, you would then want uh, both. Um, so here are tadpoles, for example. Uh, tadpoles are here in this still uh, water. Tadpoles have gills. They can take water uh, from the air, but look at what they're doing. They were going up to the surface to grab more air. Here's a fish, which can come out on, on the land. Um, it has gills. Same here with these catfish. Uh, they um, uh, can breathe underwater through their gills, but they have a way of supplementing uh, oxygen as well. Now these fish don't have uh, lungs, uh, but the uh, Sarcopterygian uh, lungfish alive today did, as did the Sarcopterygian fish of the Devonian period. And so these fish would have been capable, uh, here's a lungfish alive today, and they would have been capable of uh, breathing both using gills and uh, lungs. And so we can see this in uh, amphibians, we can see this in, um, in a lungfish alive today, that if you need oxygen to support, you know, muscle contraction and a higher metabolism, um, then you don't have to pick just the water or just uh, the air. Uh, you can be using gills to extract oxygen from uh, the water and then come to the surface to take gulps of air as well. And this is what you'll see the lungfish do. So this is a fish, it has gills and it's breathing through its gills. But at some point it comes to the surface to take a gulp of air, which now go into its lungs. Lungfish have true lungs. And so uh, once again, here's that example where we have um, the uh, a, a transitional uh, point uh, where uh, you have organisms which have both gills and lungs and therefore um, uh, can uh, modify, uh, you know, their uh, breathing and utilize uh, both. So um, tetra as tetrapods came out onto land, obviously the gills became less and less important. They lost the opercular series of bones. They developed a neck and that helped, you know, the mobility of uh, their shoulders. And even though they can still have gills as larvae and a few uh, adult amphibians retain the gills as, uh, as adults, they became to, uh, came to rely more and more on breathing oxygen from the air and less from their water. They had that internal nostril, all right? And so we can see that here. So if you look at a frog, the internal nostril is here. So when air comes in its nostril, it comes out here and then can go into the uh, lungs. Um, and so, you know, amphibians can breathe using their lungs. Unfortunately, that doesn't work very well. Um, so here you can see uh, the, uh, a frog uh, and oxygen is coming into its uh, lungs. Um, uh, and that doesn't uh, work very well. So we see more forms of respiration in amphibians. Uh, the larvae has, have external gills, uh, tadpoles have internal gills. Uh, some uh, 
amphibians will retain gills as adults. So there are uh, frogs and, um, and salamanders which are aquatic as adults. Um, but here you can see that this cutaneous respiration is really uh, important. And as I pointed out, there are lungless salamanders and a lungless frog. Now, you know, amphibians have lungs, um, but they're not all that impressive, right? And, and so lungs would get better over, uh, uh, over time. So when you look at the lungs of a frog, all right, so here's uh, the mouth of a frog, here's its larynx and trachea, and this then is a lung. They're kind of small, they're not that impressive. If you were to look at the lungs of a salamander, here they are emptying into the uh, esophagus, it's just this long bag, and here I am filling it in uh, with air, but it's not overly uh, large. Um, and uh, it's hard for salamanders to maintain their, um, their metabolism just using uh, the, um, their lungs. So a lot of them are then breathing through their skin as well. So here you see a salamander, it's sucking air in through its you know, mouth or nose, and then um, uh, into uh, uh, the lungs. But look at the throat here, all right? So that'll be very important. Um, so they have to create this suction, you know, using uh, throat uh, muscles uh, to bring uh, uh, oxygen in and out of uh, the lungs, okay? Now, it turns out that's not the best way to breathe. And so reptiles, they were the first amniotes, would breathe better, all right? So now let's look at, you know, amniotes and look at how uh, the modifications that uh, they've uh, made. Well, we see a number of changes in the amniotes. First, they tend to have longer necks than amphibians uh, do, and therefore the trachea tends to be um, uh, fairly uh, long. And so the, uh, uh, the internal nares empty into the uh, oral uh, cavity, as uh, you can see. Um, uh, some will actually create the secondary palate. I'll talk about uh, with uh, mammals in just a little bit. Uh, so uh, crocodiles have a secondary uh, palate um, uh, which separates their nose from their mouth. The armored dinosaurs had a secondary palate which separated the nose from the mouth. So I'll talk about that in a second with mammals, but a couple of the reptiles do that uh, as uh, well. Um, so uh, here's a turtle. You see it has a larynx, a trachea, and so there's a separation now between the food way, the esophagus, and the airway, the trachea, leading to the uh, lungs, and the trachea is long. The necks of amniotes uh, are uh, longer. Um, the cartilage from the gill arches has been modified to form a hyoid apparatus. So we have a hyoid bone. You saw the hyoid in the, in the turtle uh, there. Notice how much longer the trachea of a turtle is compared to the trachea of the frog that uh, I showed a second ago. Uh, here you see an alligator. Notice how long the trachea is uh, there leading into the lungs. Here you can see a bird. Uh, notice how long the, the trachea is um, uh, is uh, there. And so if you were to you know, pump air in and out of the trachea, uh, this would then uh, go into uh, the, uh, the lungs. Uh, now, there are different organisms can modify lungs to varying degrees. Uh, so some of the things that snakes have done is that if snakes have paired organs like lungs or kidneys, um, uh, snakes, sometimes all of them, sometimes certain groups of them, will reduce one of you know, them so that uh, you know, it just uh, makes uh, their bodies uh, narrower. Um, birds have a fascinating respiratory system. So before I focus on uh, mammals, just to talk about uh, birds, um, one of the problems with my respiratory system is when I inhale, okay, so right now there's a lot of air in my lungs and gas exchange is occurring there, but there's air in my trachea, right? There's air in my nasal cavity and that's not performing gas exchange. I have dead space. All right. So while most of the air that I brought in is now in my lungs, this air that's in my trachea and my larynx, it's dead space. It's not performing gas exchange. I am not getting oxygen out of all of the air that I have inhaled. Well, birds need to do better than that because flight requires such uh, high levels of, uh, of oxygen. And so um, birds have a, uh, a, the most efficient uh, respiratory uh, system. So uh, air 
uh, uh, comes in uh, their mouth or nostrils. It goes down uh, their uh, uh, trachea. But now they're going to have a system of air sacs. And these air sacs can actually even extend and go into spaces in their um, their bones. It passes an area called a syrinx, and in the songbirds, this is the area where sound is made, so the area is modified so that vibrations there can produce a sound. But um, here, the uh, uh, the air uh, will then go into uh, bronchi and uh, the lungs, all right? Um, but their uh, respiratory system is more complex, so air does not kind of come into the lungs and then go out again. Because here we have some air sacs. There are posterior uh, thoracic uh, air sacs. There are abdominal uh, air sacs. So here's the pyrobronchial lung um, uh, that uh, you see. Uh, and then there are additional uh, air sacs um, in uh, the anterior region, anterior thoracic air sacs um, and uh, the interclavicular uh, air sac and the uh, cervical air sacs, all right? So notice all of these extra uh, air sacs uh, for, um, uh, uh, for uh, spaces, uh, which then um, uh, can hold air and once again can even extend into the, uh, the bones. Um, how does this work? Well, the key is you have to follow air during two breaths. With me, the air comes in, the air comes out. You can explain it all with one breath. With birds, you need to talk about two separate breaths for air to make a complete cycle. So in the first inhale, when birds inhale the first time, air will then um, uh, go, uh, whoops. So if we were to trace air coming in, here comes the air and in inhale number one, the air is now going into those posterior thoracic air sacs and those abdominal uh, air sacs. So when birds inhale, the air goes there and then the birds exhale. And when they exhale, this is the first exhale, now, um, the uh, air is in the lungs where gas exchange is occurring. The lungs are the only place where gas exchange is uh, occurring in the lungs. But now, you know, they've exhaled, so what happens with this air? Well, now they inhale a second time, and on their second inhale, this air then goes into the anterior thoracic sacs, the interclavicular sac, the cervical sacs, and then they exhale a second time, and now the air will go out uh, their uh, mouth or nose. And so it takes two uh, breaths for the air to make a complete route through the avian respiratory system. But there's no dead space. All of this air then has oxygen removed from it. So this is one of their modifications for flight um, uh, so that they are the most efficient uh, uh, vertebrates when, with regard to a respiratory system making use of all of the oxygen uh, that comes in. And interestingly, some of this must have been evolving in the dinosaurs because in theropod dinosaurs, we can actually see holes in the bones uh, corresponding to uh, the holes uh, where um, the uh, birds have these air sacs. So that's known as pneumatization of, uh, of bones uh, having these uh, air sacs uh, here. And so um, the uh, neck and trunk vertebrae and other bones of theropod uh, dinosaurs had um, this uh, pneumatization uh, prior uh, uh, to the birds evolving. So if you look at uh, the family tree of dinosaurs, you can see that uh, some of the modifications for a uh, bird uh, flight uh, were made at different uh, points such as in the Ave Theropoda uh, group, which not only includes the ancestors of birds, but also the ancestors of many of the uh, uh, of uh, the dinosaurs. Um,
So I like to show this video to my class and I always begin by saying, you are not a salamander. And then I have to explain. Um, so look at the salamander and look at how it's drawing oxygen into its lungs. It's sucking, it's using throat muscles. Now that would be exhausting. All right, if I had to suck air in and pump it out using my throat, all right, that would be, not only would it be exhausting, I couldn't do it. I couldn't maintain my big body with my 100 degree high metabolism, with my big brain that uses a lot of oxygen. I just couldn't get enough oxygen that way. And one of the ways to, to prove that is if you look at you know, this salamander, obviously it would prefer to be getting away from, you know, the biology teacher who's got a flashlight and a camera right in front of it, but it can't because it's exhausted. It can't get enough oxygen to its muscles uh, to get rid of the lactic acid. So this is not uh, even efficient enough for the salamander ideally, and it certainly wouldn't uh, power a mammalian uh, metabolism. And so what the amniotes did, amniotes, uh, they breathe better than the amphibians do. And one of the main changes was if you look at these ribs, uh, while amphibians have ribs, they tend to be small. Frog ribs are small, salamander ribs are small. But look here at this amniote, it's long ribs. Not only curve around, but they also contact the sternum, all right? So this creates a thorax, you know, a thoracic cage. And there are muscles between the ribs called intercostals. When you know, people go out and eat ribs, obviously you're eating muscles that lie between the uh, ribs, these intercostals. Um, and the difference now is if muscles between the ribs um, then contract, this cha changes the whole volume of the uh, thorax. And this then draws air in and out of the thoracic cavity. Now, I explain that better in um, the uh, other videos dealing with the human respiratory system. But in general, um, there is this inverse relationship between volume and uh, pressure. If the volume of the thorax goes up, um, uh, the pressure goes down. So if I can use my, uh, my uh, ribs and the intercostal muscles between the ribs to make my chest bigger, as I'm about to do now, this is uncomfortable. If I open my mouth, <gasps> the air just goes in. So notice the difference between me and that salamander. That salamander was using its throat muscles to suck air in. I just have to make my chest bigger, open my mouth, <gasps> and the air goes in for free. Okay. And so when we, the volume of our thorax goes up, the pressure goes down and outside air goes rushing in. If I then want to exhale, I then make my chest smaller. And now if I open my mouth, <sighs> The air goes rushing out because when the volume went down, the pressure went up and that forced the air out. And so amniotes realize that with your long ribs and the intercostal muscles between the ribs, then one uh, could use changes in the volume of uh, the thorax uh, to move uh, air. And so then uh, this was the great uh, you know, change uh, for amniotes that had so many repercussions. So for example, if you no longer needed your skin to breathe, all right, then your skin wouldn't have to be kept moist all the time. You could develop dry scales. And as reptiles develop these dry uh, scales, this allows them to um, inhabit uh, a, a, a lots of different uh, environments and ultimately would allow for the hair and feathers of mammals and birds. So uh, humans, we use these rib, these muscles between our uh, ribs, the external intercostals, which allow our uh, thorax to expand and the internal intercostals, which can uh, cause the thorax to contract. But mammals need more oxygen than reptiles do because mammals are warm blooded, that takes energy. Mammals move differently, they're holding their bodies erect rather than dragging bellies on the ground, that takes more uh, energy. Plus they've got these big brains and brains are expensive using a lot of oxygen. So if you're going to now be warm blooded, smart and more active holding your body off the ground, you need more oxygen and reptiles struggle with that. So mammals get a new muscle and um, 
uh, extension of the rectus abdominis uh, called the diaphragm, which then separates this one big space into two, um, a thorax and an abdomen. If you ever dissect you know, a lizard, an alligator, a turtle, the lungs go down and touch the intestines. This is just one big space. In mammals, however, this diaphragm separates this abdominopelvic body cavity into two, a thoracic body cavity and, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, it's called the ventral body cavity, and mammals separate it into a thoracic cavity and an abdominopelvic uh, cavity. Um, and this diaphragm then can contract and push down on the lungs. When it does so, the lungs get longer. So when I'm breathing, I can make my chest bigger two different directions. The external intercostals can make it bigger in this plane. The diaphragm can push down and make the lungs longer in this plane. And thus, as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down, even more air comes rushing in. So mammals develop this diaphragm that amphibians I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that reptiles lack and therefore are able to move more air and are more efficient at, uh, at breathing. Um, so once again, uh, mammals, you know, some of the defining fa factors are the being warm-blooded, the bigger brain, their type of movement, but all of this is expensive and requires more oxygen. So the ancestors of mammals had to uh, address this. So the cynodont uh, reptiles, um, they did have um, uh, some of these uh, adaptations. So for example, they developed what's known as a secondary palate. So uh, let me uh, explain. Um, here, you can see the internal nostrils or the internal nares of a frog empty into an oral cavity. So um, this space inside a frog holds both food and air. So if a frog is eating or swallowing, it has to stop breathing. Same thing with the turtle, all right? The nostrils empty into the mouth. So there's one space, all right, that's for both food and air. And animals have to make a choice. What do you do? Do you eat or do you breathe? Because if you have one space, you can't do both. Whereas we mammals, we need more than that. We need to be breathing all the time. And so mammals evolve what's called a hard palate made of the maxillary and palatine bones. And then there's a soft palate uh, behind that. This separates the mouth from the nose. You can be eating a peanut butter sandwich and still be breathing, all right, because there is this um, uh, separation. And so the hard palate, which separated uh, the uh, oral and nasal cavities in mammals, uh, certainly uh, helped um, uh, uh, here. Here you can see the epiglottis, which closes off uh, the uh, airway when we swallow, all right, so that air uh, does not, uh, 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 air does not uh, come into the um, at the respiratory uh, tract, uh, mammals develop uh, true uh, vocal cords. And um, uh, the mammal uh, respiratory system is more than efficient uh, than that of uh, reptiles. The lobes have, a, uh, the lungs have a lobes in them and are separated into separate uh, lobes. We don't see that in uh, the uh, reptiles. And so here uh, uh, the mammals are uh, you know, just more efficient at breathing. These are cats' lungs as air comes uh, in and uh, out. So um, I have a uh, video just quickly reviewing the cat uh, respiratory uh, system, which is similar to the human, which I will uh, review um, uh, elsewhere, uh, whereas there is a hard uh, palate uh, which separates uh, the and so that's the roof of the mouth, separates the mouth here from the nasal cavity where the probe is going. Here's the soft palate. So um, uh, cats can eat and still uh, be uh, breathing. There are two tubes in the throat. There is the esophagus, that is the air tube, all right? And then there is the trachea, that's the food tube, all right? And so there's the nasal cavity uh, there. There are these two tubes in the throat and this piece of cartilage, the epiglottis, closes off 
the air tube so that when food is swallowed, the elastic cartilage of the epiglottis closes over the glottis so that only air goes into the trachea there um, while food goes into the esophagus, which is the second opening here, all right? Um, cats then also have uh, vocal cords um, uh, in uh, their uh, larynx, all right? And so, So just walking through the things there, uh, all amniotes have that long, so there's the esophagus. Once again, there's a second tube in the throat. Uh, there's an air tube, the trachea. There is the food tube, the esophagus, uh, and we keep them separate because we don't want food to be lodged in the trachea. The trachea is the anterior uh, tube, as you can see, the esophagus is behind it. It is a posterior. Um, it is a C-shaped uh, ring of cartilage, which uh, uh, forms rings in the uh, trachea, so you can feel the soft uh, portion on the posterior of uh, the trachea, as I'm uh, explaining there. Uh, the trachea then branches into bronchi, which goes into different lobes of the lungs. Once again, uh, reptiles don't uh, have separate you know, lobes uh, in uh, their uh, lungs. And notice this diaphragm muscle, which separates the cavity, which has the heart and the lungs, so the heart and the lungs would be here in the thorax, as opposed to the digestive organs, uh, which would be here. So the uh, intercostal muscles between the ribs and the diaphragm uh, muscle, which separates the thoracic body cavity from the abdominal pelvic uh, body cavity, uh, they are uh, critical in, uh, in breathing. Okay, so I focus on the human respiratory uh, system uh, in another playlist, which I'll show you in a second. And I'm wrapping up now uh, these changes, but the key is that, you know, the first mammals appeared in the uh, Triassic um, uh, less than 250 million years ago. That's more than 250 million years after the first vertebrates. And so some of the things that vertebrates needed in their uh, respiratory system uh, existed in the deuterostomes uh, which preceded them. Um, before there were uh, tetrapods on land, there were fish in the water which already had gills and an internal uh, narus. Uh, before there were mammals, there were reptiles which had all of these uh, changes uh, which the mammals would make uh, use of. Uh, the first mammals would get a diaphragm, a hard and a soft a palate, a pleural cavities around the lungs and uh, vocal cords. And so the human respiratory system, you know, um, is uh, one which has been, you know, modified over, you know, hundreds of uh, millions of years. And once again, in mammals, a number of changes were made to support their higher metabolism. And here's just one more look at that hard palate. Uh, and so uh, we, unlike frogs and turtles, have both a nasal cavity and an aural cavity because the maxillary and palatine bones form this shelf, this hard palate. And there's a soft palate uh, then um, uh, behind it. Uh, and so then if you look at these cows, these cows are chewing all day long, but that doesn't stop them breathing. All right, so reptiles or amphibians have to make a choice. Do I eat or do I breathe? Because if you have one space, you can't do both. Both, But with that hard palate, these um, mammals uh, can have bigger brains, warmer body temperatures, and more active lifestyles because they never have to, uh, inter uh, to interrupt their breathing. And plus the fact that now they have a diaphragm, they can take in more oxygen with each breath. Um, now, uh, mammals are not the only ones who have the, um, uh, uh, the uh, hard palate, uh, other, uh, some reptiles such as uh, crocodilians and, um, uh, and armored dinosaurs uh, evolved uh, that as well. So this has been an overview of the evolution of the respiratory system. Now, obviously uh, you might you know, be interested in you know, the human respiratory system and how it works. And then I have a separate playlist, a separate lecture video that goes through all of you know, the components of uh, the human uh, respiratory system.